Do you think that USAID, whose main job is to provide humanitarian aid globally, has the oversight for programs and experiments like Stop Spillover and Deep BZN, which are not humanitarian in nature? I think there's a very strong humanitarian case for, for preventing pandemics. I think that the absence of security oversight means that USAID was probably just not aware of the security consequences of their work. And it remains to be seen whether they will decide that it is inadvisable to maintain a ranked order list of the most threatening viruses. So do you, do you think they have the oversight ability to, to handle this job? It's unclear exactly who they're seeking advice from. Uh, my understanding is that they are seeking advice from folks with greater security expertise. And the real question is what actions are going to come of that? So would these programs go through a P3CO review? My understanding is that federally funded research does go through P3CO review. However, it is unclear whether the basic find the pathogens program would go through such review because until you find it and at least run some characterization to determine whether or not it looks like a pandemic virus, it would not necessarily be regulated. And as previously mentioned, due to the transparency issues with that committee, it's very much unclear what their remit is and is not. Okay. Are, um, do you know who's on the panel for P3 three COs? I do not. Why, why wouldn't, is it not public? My understanding is that it is, is it is not public. Why wouldn't it be public? That is an excellent question. <laughs> so you, do any of the witnesses know why it wouldn't be public? No. Is it part of the- I know it isn't public and I don't know why it is it is not so it's part of our federal government, right? Correct. And so what, what, do they think Americans are not smart enough to understand it? You'll have to ask the people at NIH. Do you know how they made the decision not to make it, the names no. public? I no. Don't. Okay. So for each of you, do you think that the P3CO review is comprehensive enough on NIH grants, or do you think gain-of-function grants have been approved without a P3CO review? Let's, let's go to Dr. Ebright. So I want to leave him out of the, and we'll go through each of you. Dr. Ebright, would you like to respond to that? Yes. So uh, as I mentioned in my uh, summary statement, there have been only three P3CO reviews in the four and a half years that the P3CO framework has been in effect. The majority of gain-of-function research of concern, enhanced potential pandemic pathogen research supported by NIH has not undergone P3CO review. It has not undergone P3CO review for the simple reason that the NIH has not identified and flagged the proposals as subject to P3CO review and has not forwarded the proposals for P3CO review. When we ask the other two to respond as well, yeah, I, I think I think uh, just echoing uh, Dr. Hebright, it's it's been a failure I think at this point in time, and so we need to find an alternative, which is perhaps to take it out of the NIH, uh, make the oversight outside of the agency that's funding. One major problem is that gain of function is a terrible term. It applies to most of biotechnology in the raw, and you can try to add qualifiers as you want, but it also inherently does not catch efforts to identify perfectly natural, but nevertheless highly lethal pandemic capable viruses. And it really doesn't matter where the thing comes from. What matters is, do you know that there is a good chance that it causes a pandemic? And again, maybe you don't think we can ever be confident more than say 50% for a given virus. But if you get a list of eight viruses that you're 50% confident, it's possible to make all eight, let them go, and you have got pretty good odds there. So. I am concerned by efforts to continue to focus on gain of function because it is so ill-defined and it seems more productive to narrow in on the classes of experiments that can substantially increase our confidence that a virus is pandemic capable wherever it comes from. And I certainly echo the calls for external security oversight. Do you think there's appropriate oversight of existing research after it's been approved to ensure continuous compliance? I would say there is not. I, importantly, the P3CO framework 
does not mandate compliance, if the P3CO committee makes a decision that the research may not pr uh, proceed, that decision is only advisory to the funding agency. It is not mandated for the funding agency. The funding agency is free to accept or not accept the decision and is free to determine whether to monitor or not to monitor the progress of the work. This is a major shortcoming. Thank you. I just want to interject on the definition whether gain of function is a good definition or not. That began with the NIH. They gave us a definition and we started with that. And so I do think Dr. Esfeld is making some good points that it, we ought to, ought to be concerned with viruses that are not created but they actually come from nature that could cause pandemics. So it's, it, 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 I think that's part of this discussion is to try to figure out where we get to. Uh, Senator Johnson. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Um, how long have we had gain of function capabilities? Is that with the CRISPR technology? Mr. Esfeld. I should, well, I should probably defer to Dr. Ebright on yeah, that. Dr. Yes, Ebright, how, 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 long, <laughs> how long have we even had this capability? The discussions have been underway since 2002 and 2003. Uh, the first examples involved reconstruction of previously eradicated or extinct pathogens. Uh, those presented a prototype for understanding experiments that would create new health threats and the need to address them. And again, we're talking a two decade long discussion. But again, the technology emerged or they started discussing and then developed the technology. What, which the discussions first? occurred, the discussions occurred as the technology emerged. It became possible to do this effectively starting uh, at the beginning of the millennium. The technologies have uh, increased in sophistication and have increased, increased in ease and decreased in cost over time. Yes, t talk about the ease and the cost, because uh, I've heard it is very accessible now and it's very cheap and you can basically, you know, a knowledgeable individual can basically do this in their garage. I think that's an exaggeration, but as Dr. Esfeld has pointed out, the given the genome sequence of a virus, it is typically possible to reconstruct infectious particles of the virus and to do so for costs well under $10,000 US in one person month or two person months. So for a, an equipped laboratory, the kind of laboratory that would be present in any state program and that is present in many research laboratories at academic institutions, this is uh, eminently possible. So again, reconstructing a virus is one thing, but my understanding what the at least theory might be with SARS, excuse me, SARS-CoV-2 is there's gene splicing that occurred here and, and some very unusual markers in this furin cleavage site and beyond my comprehension exactly what that means, but talk to me a little bit about the, the whole gene splicing aspect of this. So there's two ways to edit a virus. Nowadays, the easiest way is usually to assemble it from scratch using synthetic DNA. But if it's large, then in some cases, it's better to create the altered piece that you wish to insert into the virus and then use a tool such as CRISPR to do the insertion into the backbone. With respect to the cost, the first virus with a chemically synthesized genome from synthetic DNA was made in 2002. Since then, the cost of gene synthesis has fallen by roughly a thousandfold. So today, the cost of ordering the components of an infectious influenza virus, for example, the synthetic DNA costs less than $1,000. And that does not require any further editing. That just requires following the reverse genetics protocol, transfecting it into the cells to get the infectious virus. And I estimate that there are around 30,000 people who can do that who have doctorates. And you can say 125 virology PhDs per year in the United States. That's roughly one third in the world probably four times as many people who have degrees in other disciplines, such as mine, who can do it, assume a 20-year career, and that's 30,000 people at a few technicians. So the, uh, was, there, was there a specific incidence or something that uh, concerned people that caused the pause? <laughs> uh, yes, there was uh, experiments in influenza in the Netherlands and Wisconsin uh, that took a, a, a virus that was 90% lethal but not airborne and uh, created it, uh, made it airborne through uh, passage in the laboratory. And that, that occurred when? 
2013, 2012. And that caught the attention of who? I mean, who, who was alarmed by that and instituted the pause? I know it ha occurred under President Obama, but which member of our health agencies that? Uh... Yeah, I think, I think Dr. Dr. Ebright would be the best to answer that. Dr. Ebright. So, so the, the proximal impetus for the pause was a series of events, laboratory accidents at federal laboratories that have uh, access to and storage of uh, potential pandemic pathogens. The accidents included an anthrax incident at the CDC, uh, another anthrax incident at a U.S. Army facility at Dugway in Utah, and uh, the finding of uh, unsecured vials labeled smallpox virus in an FDA, CDC, uh, FDA NIH freezer uh, in Maryland. And those three incidents occurring in close succession uh, resulted in uh, a hearing in the House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, and then action by the Office of Science, Technology, and Policy. So the pause was driven ultimately from the White House, from the Obama Office of Science, Technology, and Policy. So listening to your testimony, I'm assuming all three of you would agree with this statement that this research, and I would say even the, the mining of dangerous potential pathogens, you know, go, go crawl in a bat cave to try and pull these things out and bring them into a lab, there's certainly no benefit that overrides the risk. We shouldn't be doing this at all. Yeah, I call it gain of function and gain of opportunity where you bring a virus back. Uh, and as I said, my analysis is that it hasn't contributed to the response to this pandemic. So we shouldn't do it. I mean, we shouldn't be, you're, we can talk about controls, but bottom line, we shouldn't have controls because we shouldn't even do it. Is that your position as well? For balancing the potential benefits of prevention against the risk of accidents. It can go either way, depending on the numbers you use for those. You can reasonably come out with either answer. <clears throat> when you add the misuse case, that is what absolutely blows it out of the water. Dr. Ebright. I believe a strong case can be made, or a case can be made, that certain components of gain-of-function research of concern, particularly components involving pathogens that are currently in human populations, are categorically separate and more justifiable than other components of gain-of-function research of concern. For example, currently SARS-CoV-2, the virus responsible for COVID, is present in millions of humans and is generating variant after variant. Gain-of-function research of concern on SARS-CoV-2 involving the creation of new variants and analysis of the threat posed by them uh, arguably can be justified because this is not creating new health threats that won't arise without intervention, but is addressing a health threat that's in place currently. For that reason, and for reasons like that, I believe enhancing the oversight of the research is a more effective and more prudent strategy than simply banning it. I would say improve oversight, but would you also agree dramatically limit it? Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Marshall. Well, th thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I hope America is listening today. And to our witnesses, let me say welcome, and I regret that none of you were able to get into the Kansas State University biochemistry program, uh, but uh, I certainly appreciate your credentials that are all here today. I think it's important to not only identify the true problem, but also talk about where we've been, and you all can help us fill into some of the pieces here when we talk about gain-of-function research. It was late in 2011 when the NSABB, which is the NIH's advisory board, stopped two scientists from publishing an influenza gain-of-function study that I believe Dr. Ebright was referring to. And they stopped it because they were afraid it could educate bioterrorists. So this is 2011. Over a decade, over a decade ago, scientists had figured out how to make H5N1 which is highly pathogenic avian influences more contagious. In 2012, those two scientists and 39 others implemented a voluntary gain-of-function research pause on influenza experiments. In early 2012, Dr. Fauci 
encouraged all influenza scientists to pause gain of function and said, and I'm quoting Dr. Fauci, 2012, it's essential we respect the concern of the public domestically or globally and not ask them to take the word of the influenza scientists. It's interesting to me that Dr. Fauci was focused on the messaging, but he still wanted to continue the gain of function research. Again in 2012, Dr. Fauci also said almost prophetically that he worried about unregulated laboratories, perhaps outside of the United States, doing work sloppily and leading to an inadvertent pandemic. And he went on to say the accidental release is what the world is really worried about. I go forward to 2014 now, after biosecurity accidents in, U in the United States research labs, which our witnesses have talked about, the Obama White House implemented the second gain-of-function moratorium on influenza plus MERS and SARS because of the potential risk of lab accidents and inherent gain-of-function da danger. But gain-of-function still, still continued at the University of North Carolina. Research later that we shared with Dr. Shi, the bat lady. Nevertheless, clearly the U.S. government and Dr. Fauci knew that the viral gain of function research was very concerning. And almost counterintuitively, while Dr. Fauci encouraged United States scientists to pause their GOF studies, Dr. Fauci offshored, that, offshored the pause research to China, not once, but twice. In 2012, Dr. Fauci gave a new grant to Peter Daszak's EcoHealth Alliance for Influenza Research in China, and then again in 2014, Dr. Fauci gave another grant to Daszak for SARS research in China. Daszak partnered with who? The Wuhan Institute of Virology. In late 2017, the NIH announced a lift on the gain-of-function moratorium, what became known as the P3CO framework, which we referred to, referred to apparently without consultation from a Senate-confirmed State Department head or national security leadership. Also significant, there was no OSTP director in place and only an acting HHS secretary at the helm. So what was the result of this? NIH essentially lifts the moratorium on their own by slipping it in between administrations and self-policing. And today, we can't see the research record for Dr. Fauci's offshore projects because the Chinese Communist Party supposedly has Eco's health records and NIH resists sharing theirs. So I'll get to my question now. Dr. Ebright, could EcoHealth's research in China have led to the COVID-19 pandemic and Dr. Fauci's worst fears that a lab accident in a foreign lab became reality? Yes. Lapses in U.S. oversight of gain-of-function research of concern may have caused the current pandemic and could cause future pandemics. The U.S. government funded high-risk gain-of-function research and high-risk enhanced potential pandemic pathogens research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology in 2016 to 2019. The research overlapped the pause that was in effect in 2014 to 2017 and met the criteria to be paused but was not paused. The research also overlapped the subsequent policy, the P3CO framework that has been in effect from 2018 to the present and met the criteria for federal risk benefit review under the P3CO framework, but did not undergo federal risk benefit review under the P3CO framework. Thank, thank you so much. I have to stop and point out too that USAID, who is knee deep in this type of research, is part of the State Department where they can get the security advice that they should have asked for before they cleared this with P3CO. Um, certainly, I believe that this virus came from Wuhan, China, and that it is a product of gain-of-function research. This is a bipartisan national security issue, like several of our witnesses have, have testified, that this viral gain-of-function could become, it has become, a, a weapon of mass destruction, that this model, this is a 3D model, what the COVID virus looks like, and this is the gain of function. This is the, the protein spike, the two units that allows this key to fit into the door perfectly and the, and the, 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 the cleavage site and, and all that. This became a nuclear hand grenade is what happened. Dr. Quay, then Dr. Esfeld, considering the extreme risk of this research and the incredulous obstruction by the NIH, USAID, EcoHealth in China, should Congress immediately pause this dangerous research. 
Uh, I think that's, a, that's an appropriate step for Congress to take. Okay. Dr. Esfeld? I think it would be somewhat dangerous to attempt to pause gain-of-function research when it's evident that that term is so malleable as to be evaded at will and also could plausibly do damage by applying to science that is not specifically directed at potential pandemic pathogens. Are there any countries that you would say we shouldn't be doing this type of uh, research with? When it comes to identifying pandemic-capable viruses that could kill millions of people and will necessarily be shared with scientists worldwide who will be able to access them, I do not think that we should be doing it. I do not think that China should be doing it. I do not think that anyone should be doing it because it is expected to kill 100 times as many people as it might save, even if we could perfectly prevent an identified natural virus from spilling over. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have some more questions if we have time for later, but I yield the floor back. Thank you. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the witnesses for being here. Uh, Dr. Coy, if I could just start with you. You said in your, in your written testimony that the genome of COVID has some of the hallmarks of, of gain-of-function research, and in particular, three genomic regions you say have the signature of synthetic biology. One region has features of the two types of forbidden gain-of-function research that are associated with bioweapons development. And you said in your opening remarks that you believe COVID-19 was the product of, of gain-of-function research and was from a lab leak from uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology. My question, I guess, is do you think that China engaged in a cover-up to prevent the world from knowing the true origins of this virus and the lab leak? Uh, I, I think there's abundant evidence that they have not shared all the information they had at the time. They continue to not share information. I could give you a laundry list of 20, 20 things that they've done, starting with a a website with 21,000 viruses on September 12th, 2 a.m. someone was in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. That had been available to virologists for, for a decade. It was taken offline. It's not been returned. We've asked uh, to see it. No one that I know of has ever seen it. It goes on from there. Are you concerned with the continuation and expansion of Chinese gain-of-function research? Well, I think I testified here that, they, that on, in December 2019, they were doing synthetic biology on a cloning vector of the Nipah virus, which is 60% lethal. We just experienced a 1% lethal virus. Uh, my estimates would be that that could set us back a millennium. Um, the, the Black Plague was a 20% lethal event, and it was 250 years for civilization to return. Let me ask you this. How safe were the testing conditions at Wuhan, to your knowledge? Well, I think that a, a lot of the Western virologists actually used that, the findings of that as a way to, to get around saying it was okay at the beginning. All of the work that I've described is being done at what's called BLSA 2-3 level, which is commonly spoken of as a, as a, the Dennis, a Dennis laboratory level of, of biosafety. So maybe a little higher than that, but it, that's not a bad euphemism. It, it, you said, uh, I think in your testimony, this is the most dangerous research that, that you have ever encountered. Um, what makes this particular research so dangerous? <laughs> If you're doing experiments with a pathogen that is 60% lethal but is not airborne, and you make it airborne in the laboratory, and someone walks out with it, NEPA has a 21-day incubation period. It's perfect for, for widespread spread uh, without being detected. Uh, we couldn't afford 60 We can't afford 10% lethality. Yeah. Um, Dr. Ebright, let me uh, ask you about the merits of, of uh, gain-of-function research, because I was struck by something you said in your written testimony. You said gain-of-function research has no civilian practical applications. Um, from a research perspective, then, what, why do it? I mean, what's the, what's the value, the real value of gain-of-function research? Not a matter of value, but incentives, particularly incentives within the academic research ecosystem. Gain-of-function research of concern is fast and easy, much faster and much easier than vaccine or drug development. And gain-of-function research is publishable, and gain-of-function research is fundable. With those four incentives in place, fast, easy, fundable, and publishable, uh, the research will be performed. What uh, is... Eliminate any one of those incentives, and it will not be. So thinking about China for a second, what, what's China's interest in gain-of-function research? They have witnessed the United States leading the way with gain-of-function research. Most gain-of-function research of concern performed to date has been performed either in the U.S. with U.S. funding or overseas with U.S. funding. Uh, China 
has wished to be part of that and has participated in gain of function research of concern in China with US funding and has also supported gain of function research of concern uh, in China entirely through Chinese programs. So uh, let me ask you this. Uh, gain of function research and bioweapons. What what what's the what's the connection there? I mean, what role does gain of function what? research play? As I mentioned, there are no civilian practical applications. There are immense bioweapons practical applications. Uh, as you've heard from Dr. Esfelt, the potential pandemic pathogens that can emerge from such studies are potential weapons of mass destruction, inexpensive, accessible, easily distributed weapons of mass destruction. Let me um, let me ask you about some of the things that you have commented on with regard to what NIH and Dr. Fauci have said, and frankly, the lies they've been caught in regarding the coronavirus. I want to highlight two of them. In response to a congressional inquiry from October of 2021, just last year, the NIH attempted to walk back assertions by NIH Director Collins and Fauci that NIH had not funded gain-of-function research in Wuhan. You commented at the time saying, I'm going to quote you now, NIH specifically Collins, Fauci, and Tabak lied to Congress, lied to the press, and lied to the public knowingly, willfully, brazenly. On May the 11th, Dr. Fauci said the NIH and NAIAD categorically has not funded gain-of-function research to be conducted in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. You commented on that, saying the documents make it clear that assertions by the NIH director, Francis Collins, and Fauci that the NIH did not support gain-of-function research are untruthful. So just expand on that, if you would. I mean, what are the implications of Dr. Fauci's continued blatant dishonesty regarding NIH's funding of gain-of-function research in Wuhan? I stand by my statement. The statements made on repeated occasions to the public, to the press, and to policymakers uh, by the NIA director, uh, Dr. Fauci, have been untruthful. I do not understand why those statements are being made because they are demonstrably false. Can I ask you just about in my in my few remaining seconds here, let me ask you about an effort to, to shut down any kind of questioning of the origins of, of COVID. On February 19, 2020, a group of virologists and others published that famous letter, infamous letter in The Lancet, which said, among other things, we stand together to strongly condemn conspiracy theories suggesting COVID-19 does not have a natural origin. And of course, we later found out that the Lancet letter had been organized by Peter Daszak, uh, president of EcoHealth Alliance, which we've discussed today, operated a lab in Wuhan with a $600,000 five-year annual grant of taxpayer dollars from Fauci's and AID to study the bat coronaviruses. That letter conveniently concluded by stating, we declare no competing interests. Many people designate this letter as the first effort to, to quash any kind of debate about the origins of COVID-19. Do you think, do you think that labeling the lab leak theory as a conspiracy theory so early on had the effect of slowing down investigations into the origins of the virus? It certainly had that effect, but it, the uh, Lancet letter that you described was only one of two efforts to impose the false narrative that science shows SARS-CoV-2 entered humans through natural spillover, and that that is the consensus view of scientists. One of the efforts was the Lancet letter you discussed. The other effort uh, was uh, coordinated and orchestrated through the National Institutes of Health, through the NIA director, uh, Dr. Fauci, and the NIH director, Dr. Collins, and resulted in the publication of uh, an opinion article entitled proximal origins of SARS-CoV-2, making the case, again, uh, that SARS-CoV-2 could not have been uh, a product of uh, research-related spillover. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Had there not been a pandemic, I think there would still be a need for this hearing. Um, this discussion, Dr. Ebright had gotten this started back as early as 2003, 2004. Others have commented on the, the danger of being able to manipulate influenza viruses uh, to be used as either weapons or by accidental release. But I think given that there was this pandemic, that a million Americans died, you know, I lost friends, I have good friends to, to the pandemic. 
I think we should be curious. I, I just am uh, perplexed by the lack of curiosity on some as to know, are there any precautions we can take? Are there any kind of government oversight that we could do to try to prevent this from happening? Now, some will say, well, we can't prove it came from a lab. That's in all possibility true that we can't prove it, but there are arguments to be made and, and examination of facts to give us an idea of whether it might have come from a lab. And even if we didn't, I think that this could have come from a person in a lab handling a virus, if it was a virus out of nature, and we've discussed that as well. But I do think that we have to get to the truth of the matter of whether or not dangerous research was going on that should have been reviewable. We had a pause of gain of function research, but then we had research occurring during the pause that should have gone to this committee, this P3CO committee, and didn't get to the committee. And uh, I think Dr. Ebrights described it well. He says that in Wuhan in 2016, 2018 period, they were constructing novel chimeric SARS-related uh, coronaviruses that combined the spike gene of uh, bat SARS coronavirus with the rest of the genetic information of a SARS-1 related virus, one that was already known to have lethality, and they found that it could efficiently infect human airway cells and exhibited up to a 10,000-fold increase in viral growth. But then when we've asked before, is this gain of function, we get sort of arguments and protestations that this isn't gain of function, as if this is no big deal and the experts looked at this. But as we look farther into this, we find that the experts never looked at this, that it's sort of a select-in kind of program to this committee. It doesn't go looking for dangerous research. It looks at it if you come to them and say, hey, I think I've got gain-of-function research. Do you all want to look at my research? And so this opting-in aspect of this. But I think it's important that we get to the truth. You know, was there research going on in Wuhan that was dangerous? Was it funded by the NIH? And should it have gone through this committee process? I think by the definition that they have given us, you know, gain of function, I think I agree with Dr. Esfeld, could be better defined, and particularly if we're going to have oversight on this, we're going to have to figure out what our oversight is going to be. So by all means, moving forward, we need to ask and include the scientists to get a precise definition of what we're talking about if we want to have more oversight. But we have to look back before we can look forward, not so much to assign blame, but to figure out is it really necessary? Do we need to be having hearings on this? Should we have follow-up hearings? Should we have legislation? And if a million people died and there's a chance this came from a lab, I think without question we should. Both sides of the aisle should be looking at this. So I guess my question, I think it's pretty clear, but I'd like to go uh, through everybody, even though Dr. Ebright has said this was gain of function, to each of the three witnesses, was the research where you take the backbone of an, a SARS-1 virus that has known lethality and you mix it together with an unknown uh, bat virus S protein uh, genes to create a new virus, was this gain of function according to the NIH definition and should it have been reviewed and discussed by this committee that was supposed to prevent dangerous research from going on? We'll start with Dr. Ebright. So as you mentioned, uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology constructed novel chimeric SARS-related coronaviruses that combined the spike gene of one coronavirus with the genetic information of another. They showed that the resulting viruses efficiently infected human airway cells and efficiently replicated in human airway cells. And they showed that the resulting viruses exhibited up to 10,000-fold enhancement of viral growth in lungs and up to four-fold enhancement of lethality in mice engineered to display human receptors on airway cells. Based on those facts, and they are indeed facts, uh, the research was gain of function research of concern subject to the pause and was uh, enhanced potential pandemic pathogen research subject to the P3CO framework. Nevertheless, due to the failure of the NIH to forward the uh, proposals for review, the work was not paused and there was no P3CO review. Dr. Quay. So the Wuhan Institute of Virology is unique in the entire world. Before 2019, 65% of all publications on coronaviruses came from that single institution. They're unique for two reasons. For almost a decade, they were going into bat caves throughout China and actually back into Africa as well, uh, 20 visits a year, uh, and bringing these samples back to the laboratory. So on the one hand, they had the largest collection of raw material backbones from nature to then do gain-of-function research on. 
they trained in Galveston, Texas and in, in North Carolina and were doing experiments, published experiments between 2015 and 2019. I be, believe it's the confluence of those two activities, gain of opportunity, bringing things back from bat caves and gain of function research uh, that led to the pandemic. Dr. Esfeld. On the list of experiments that you would need to perform in order to learn whether a novel virus could potentially cause a pandemic, you would need to test growth in human primary cells, such as human airway epithelial cells, and you would need to test transmission in a suitable animal model. So the question is, if they were not intending to determine whether a novel recombinant event between these coronaviruses could lead to something that might kill millions of people, then why were they doing it? If there was no chance that it would come up with a result that looked like it was more dangerous, what's the point? What's the scientific hypothesis? So again, whatever you call it, what they were trying to do was identify a biological agent that has a good chance of being able to kill millions of people if released. And they shared the description of what they did and they shared the genome sequence because they thought that this would make us safer because they think that knowing which viruses in nature might cause pandemics makes us safer. They did not consider the security risks. And it's worth noting that both USAID and NIH funded those particular coronavirus chimera studies. USAID, to my understanding, has since disavowed those chimeric recombination studies and announced that they will only focus on finding natural pandemic-capable viruses, which is at least a step in the right direction. But again, I would call that gain of function. Another reasonable scientist would say, no, that's not gain of function because the term is so ill-defined. Even beyond the term, though, would it be qualified as dangerous research that actually should have gone before this committee, the P3CO committee, and been reviewed? <laughs> well, here is where you come back to the problem of thinking this as a health and safety issue rather than a national security issue. The question is, why are we trying to identify readily accessible agents that could plausibly be used to kill millions and will, as soon as identified, fall into the hands of all of our adversaries, as well as perhaps individual terrorists who would just want to use them. The fundamental principle behind even wanting to do these experiments in the first place is, I think, a fundamental threat to not just national security, but international security. It's just hard to see why you would ever want to do this when you think about the misuse potential. And I haven't seen anyone else publish a numerical model of that. Now, people have said, well, you know, this, you know, this the closest relative that we found is only 96% identical to COVID-19. This couldn't have come from the lab. Um, they've also mistakenly accused those who say it came from the lab of saying, oh, it came from this particular variant. But I think what people who are saying that could, this could have come from a lab are saying that there could also be possibly other viruses that are closer that were manipulated, or that the one that is 96% analogous to COVID-19 could have gone through serial cell culture and become COVID-19. I guess I'd like to ask each three of you whether or not the, the variant that is 96% uh, uh, analogous to COVID-19, could it through serial passage um, be transformed to COVID-19? Is it possible? Uh, is it so far away that you can't do it experimentally? Could you do it through gene splicing? Could, could, could it be done? Or is it something that argues that this couldn't have come from the lab? We'll start with Dr. Ebright. Uh, the closest relatives are more on the order of 97% identical to SARS-CoV-2 in genome than 96%. Uh, viruses with that level of genetic difference cannot rapidly, in the time scale of weeks or months, move from their state into being a proximal progenitor of SARS-CoV-2. However, in the laboratory, those viruses can be combined at will. They can be combined in particular using a method that would be described as uh, constructing a consensus genome virus. To construct a consensus genome virus, one takes the sequences of several related viruses, identifies the most commonly observed nucleotides at each position in these sequences, and then 
synthesizes the nucleic acid corresponding to the average, if you will, the consensus genome uh, for the group of viruses. This has been done successfully in coronaviruses. This has been done and published a decade ago in coronaviruses. Uh, that kind of research could have been done using viruses that are on the order of 96 to 97 percent identical in their genome sequences to SARS-CoV-2, and with two or three or more such viruses genome sequences, one could develop a consensus. And that's just one of a series of potential routes by which uh, one of the known viruses with 96 to 97 percent identity could, through a laboratory, in a relatively short time, be transformed into a uh, progenitor of SARS-CoV-2. Dr. Quay, uh, the three sets of viruses that are close to SARS-2 are one from southern China, RITG-13, and a series of banal from northern Laos. And uh, as indicated, there are probably 1,200 letters different in the whole 30,000 letter alphabet. In nature, that takes approximately 40 years, so the, the most common ancestor is about 40 years ago. Uh, but most of that can be done in a couple days in a laboratory. However, I don't believe we currently have the, the starting material, the backbone um, on which SARS-2 was, was found. I think it's one of the other 21,000 viruses in the database that was taken down at 2 a.m. September 12th, 2019. So a great deal of information was destroyed by the Chinese. It was taken offline, not available. I don't know if it was destroyed. Right. But, yeah. Dr. Esfeld? If a PhD student proposed to take a 30,000 base pair viral genome and attempt to passage it in the laboratory to a, acquire a, a thousand or so mutations, I would say that is not a PhD project. Go do something else. So I concur with Dr. Ebright that the only way that you could get something so divergent would be to computationally design it and synthesize it, which could certainly have been done from what data set and again, why? Why would you do such a thing unless you want to know what the ancestral virus was like and whether the ancestral virus was dangerous? There are basic science reasons why you might want to just know where they all came from, but at the end of the day, the reason why this research is of interest to us is the risk of pandemics. And so again, why would you run the tests to determine whether something was pandemic capable. And they certainly ran those on all of the other coronaviruses that they found and thought might be dangerous. So on the other hand, they never published anything like that, right? And presumably they would have. They published their data on the other stuff. So again, this is why I, I, I don't think we have enough information to know. But right. it was definitely not passaged in a lab from something that was 97%. Right. I, I agree. And one of the things that tips us off that they may have been trying was in 2018, they asked for money from DARPA. And in that money, they wanted to insert the furin cleavage site, which makes it highly infectious in humans. And they, so if they had the idea of that, they're asking for money, they must have thought, wow, we can do this, and this is going to be a great experiment. Even our government finally at that point decided not to fund that. But what they're asking for, and this is why I think there was a holy cow moment when all of a sudden these scientists see the sequence of, of COVID-19, they're going, oh my goodness, didn't they ask us in 2018 to put that furin cleavage site in? And lo and behold, it's there. So what I'd like to ask, and I'm gonna finish with this and then we'll have another round if some people would like to ask some other questions is, um, Dr. Quay, could you sort of lay out in as simple a fashion as possible, two or three items about the virus that makes you think it came from, and, and I don't think anybody knows with 100% whether this came from a lab or whether it came from animals, but there is some compelling evidence that suggests it could have come from the lab. And, you know, even if it was a 10% chance it came from a lab, it's another reason for us to be concerned about uh, having oversight on this kind of research. But can you give me two or three things that this virus has that make you think it's lab versus uh, some of the evidence for MERS and SARS that was that it came from animals? Yeah, there are three regions, the receptor binding domain, the furin cleavage site, and this protein eighth from the left called ORF8. With respect to the re with receptor binding domain, if you look at what happened with SARS-1, we have the virus sequence when it first was in civet cats in the markets, jumped into a few humans. We have the virus sequence then. It started infecting more. And then we have the virus sequence when it became, when it 
human to human passage could occur and an epidemic occurred. And so you can see the progression of mutations as the virus adapted from being in civet cats and then being in humans. The first jump into humans, it had only 15% of the mutations it needed to support an epidemic. Okay, let's flip to SARS-CoV-2. When you look at, at, at the virus uh, that first entered the human population, out of, the, out of all of the uh, changes in the receptor binding domain, there are 200 possible chain, 200 amino acids, 4,000 possible changes. There were only 17 mutations that could make it a better virus. Its receptor binding uh, 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 optimization was 99.5%. And in fact, one of the 17 ended up being the Delta variant. So that kind of optimization juxtaposed by the fact that there were no patients in Wuhan, 36,000 blood back specimens tested for antibodies uh, in 2019. Not a single patient was infected. Let's go back to SARS-1. 20% of all people in the markets were infected while the virus was practicing to set up an epidemic, 1% of the general population. So we would have expected 360 in the general population in Wuhan. We had zero. Furin cleavage site has obviously never occurred in this related viruses, cervical viruses that split from their, their cousins, the MERS viruses, around the time of William crossing the channel, 10,060. That was when the cervical viruses came. So there's never been a furin cleavage site. And the genetic sequence of it uses a code that's never been used, the CGG, CGG dimer, as it's called, which is, has never been used before. Finally, ORF8, this protein that goes into the bloodstream and suppresses interferon response, so you're asymptomatic, and suppresses uh, AHC antigen presentation, so you can't make good antibodies. This was the, the subject of two master's theses at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. I have found no Western scientists that worked on this uh, this uh, location in the genome before 2019. Um, and the protein is not present in MERS. It has a 5% homology in SARS-1. Between SARS-1 and SARS-2, there's a protein there, but it's only 5% homologous. But this master thesis, the first one, optimized its function in suppressing interferon, symptoms of, of fever and chills, and suppressed its antigen presentation. The second one was making synthetic biology tools so you could move it around inside genomes. So to reiterate, um, there's been no animals found that have COVID-19. When they did find that animals had the first SARS and MERS, they found it out within months. When they tested the animals in question, 90% of the animals had the SARS virus. So we haven't found any animals yet with COVID-19. And then most viruses that come from animals first aren't very infectious at first, and they infect a few humans. So you don't have a pandemic that does this, it smolders and then does this. During the smoldering phase, you find background antibodies that people have had it, even if they don't know they had it. So when they tested the background of people who were working with the animals that had COVID, um, they found 20% of them had antibodies to having had SARS. SARS-1, yes, correct. But then if we test the people in the marketplace, uh, we're not finding that. If we look at the people in the Wuhan marketplace, uh, we're not finding significant numbers that were positive and finding almost nobody positive from the previous year that had been ill. No, it's zero out of 36,000. Thank you. Uh, why don't we do a second round and why don't we start, we'll go the same order. Senator Johnson. Dr. Quay, how did we find out about the Nipah virus? Uh, so, um, in December uh, 2019, five patients at a Wuhan hospital had their specimens sent, a bronchial lavage, where they stick a, a throat and get it lost, to the one Institute of Virology for sequencing. The process is to amplify with a PCR process. You make a lot of copies of what's in the specimen, and you usually inadvertently make copies of what's going on in the laboratory. So um, the one Institute of Virology probably regrets, but they put a 55 million letter database of the background information up in the gene bank, which is the NIH's uh, database there, of everything going on. We found 20 strange things in these patient specimens, honeysuckle genes, uh, horse viruses. 19 of the things we found were in publications from the laboratory over the previous two years. So this clearly was a signal of what was going on in the lab around there. The one thing they didn't publish on was this uh, cloning vectors of the Nipah virus. So it's in the patient specimens because it was in the laboratory at the time, not in the patients. But it, it, and they have never published on that uh, at this point in time. How, how do we know it's 60% lethal? Oh, the Nipah virus has, has had epidemic, sporadic epidemics in, in uh, the, the belt around Africa and India. 
uh, Bangladesh, and it's between 60 and 80 percent lethal in the pockets where it comes out. It's not very transmissible like Ebola, so it, it kills 100 or 200 people and then burns out. But if they made it airborne, it would be different. Okay, so so this is a virus that occurs in nature, but you just d detected it in this database, okay. I, I, I detected cloning vectors with it, so they're manipulating it, which is n not allowed by biological treaties. So and that's a pretty scary scenario right there, that uh, the Wuhan lab that might have been the originator of the coronavirus is fooling around with something far more deadly. Yes. And they're obviously mums the word. Uh, Dr. Ebright, I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused. Um, you talked about, well, if we were doing gain of function on the current coronavirus, that'd be okay. But that's not the indication I'm getting from Dr. Esfeld here. I think what really concerns me is, and I'm not saying that you're saying this is the justification, you're just saying that the reality situation is we've got, we've got research centers, we've got scientists that are doing this gain of function research for two, I mean, very dangerous gain of function research for two completely unnecessary reasons because it's fundable and it's publishable. I mean, I would call those, you know, again, that's, so you got little greed involved and you have hubris. Is that what you're saying? Uh, the research is performed because it's fast, easy, fundable, and publishable. In the academic research ecosystem, those are determinants of what research gets pursued. So I, I view that as a very corrupt research ecosystem. I mean, if, if, that's, if that is what is driving research, and very dangerous research, it's so that you can, get a, you can get a funding grant just to do something, I guess, for grins, and then you can publish it and get the uh, academic kudos for it. Matt, I'm sorry, I just find that sick. I would not use the term corrupt. I would not see any real difference between this than the activity of a hedge fund or the activity of a bank or a broker. Uh, the key point is, is that because of these incentives, self-regulation from within the community is insufficient. The scientific research community will follow the incentives. It will never effectively self-regulate on these issues. But for I, this reason, we for, for this reason, we have regulations with force of law for vertebrate animals research and for human subjects research. We need regulations with force of law for gain of function research of concern. Well, I, think, I think the difference, if it's a bank or hedge fund, I mean, they're, they're doing things for an economic incentive to produce something, you know, to fund a manufacturing site or fund some kind of business. Again, th this is research that has, again, I, I'm not hearing the benefit of this research. I'm, so there's I'm a benefit to the seeing, researcher. And I'm, I'm seeing the risk, I'm seeing the danger. I'm not seeing the benefit other than what you're saying for the researcher itself to just get money, to do something that's dangerous, and to have the, the, again, the academic kudos for being published. I, I don't know, I, I, maybe you don't like the word corrupt, it's, it's completely useless. It has no benefit to society, it just has risk, just has danger. Um, I'm, <laughs> I have no further, you know, Dr. Asfeld, I mean, do you disagree with that assessment? I think that all institutions follow their incentives. And I think that that set of incentives, fast, easy, fundable, and publishable, insofar as fundable and publishable are ways of curing heart disease and cancer and forestalling aging, those are all certainly fundable and publishable, perhaps not as fundable as we would like. Certainly research into defenses against the next pandemic is right now somewhat fundable. I wish it could be more fundable. But, but, but it's publishable, so right? It depends on what you're on talking what. about. Fundable and publishable have a beneficial reason. What I'm, what I'm hearing from the three of you witnesses, there's just not a benefit to this. There is so one one clarification. You mentioned on endemic human viruses like SARS-2. Why do this? Well, if you want to predict the next variant that is going to arise anyway within a couple of months, one that already exists then that's why researchers do things like 
deep mutational scanning on the, of the spike protein to look and see which ones of them might have a bit of an edge in terms of maintaining infection while evading immunity a little bit and is likely to be the next variant. That then lets us design the next vaccine against, that, against the variant and guess correctly. We have to do this with flu every year. Flu vaccines are terrible usually because we often guess wrong. So that kind of research can help improve our guess as to what is correct. But as whole... soon as you do, as you make a change that would not occur in nature, <clears throat> then it becomes dangerous because that is something that a more pathogenic mutation could be inserted. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a problem and there's no justification for doing that because nature's not gonna come up with it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again to our witnesses for hanging in there with us. I wanna start by going back to a comment that Dr. Esfeld made that USAID paid for gain-of-function research in China. And most people don't realize that um, because USAID won't give us the records. And we've been trying for over a year to get those records, which is why we're holding up one of their nominees uh, as well. So thank you for pointing that out, Dr. Esfeld. I'm gonna to go to Dr. Ebright next and talk a little bit more about EcoHealth Alliance, that they're about their record of non-compliance. Uh, they couldn't provide research records to NIH when NIH requested them. They didn't have an adequate agreement with WIV. They don't use the appropriate rate of pay for WIV researchers. Uh, there continue to be non-compliance with financial conflicts of interest policies. Dr. Ebright, based upon EcoHealth Alliance's record of non-compliance, should they continue to be eligible to receive federal funds? Their most important aspect of non-compliance was that they were informed by the NIH in terms and conditions on the notice of award for their grant that in the event they encountered viral growth in their engineered coronaviruses that exceeded the growth of the parent coronaviruses by more than a factor of 10, they must immediately inform NIH and immediately stop the research. They did not do this. So that's not merely a financial violation. That is a serious hazard violation and a violation that may be connected to the origins of the current pandemic. Uh, with that being said, uh, it is inexplicable that they were awarded subsequent federal awards and that they remain eligible to receive federal awards. Wow. I need to submit for the record. Thank you for the answer. A couple of articles. First, I, I quoted Dr. Fauci. This is a an article from Science, July 2012, a handsome young Dr. Fauci, so I want to submit that for the record. In my next two questions, I want to submit uh, something from the Wall Street Journal, a couple articles as well, uh, regarding genomic sequences. Without objection. So we'll go to uh, Dr. Quay next. You may be familiar with the genomic sequences in NIH's database, I think you spoke about them, that Chinese scientists asked to be removed and how they were uh, from early COVID uh, Wuhan patients. Do you believe there could have been more data in NIH's database submitted by Chinese scientists that could hold the key to the COVID-19 origins? Yeah, this was a really nice piece of work by Jesse Bloom at the University of Washington, who found uh, not in the NIH database, but on some Amazon web servers, uh, the actual sequences of viruses from very early patients that had been put on gene bank and then removed before they were published and made available. And the remarkable thing is, um, again, going to another piece of good research, the virus that first came out, the first one a virus, is three mutations away from what we now know is, is probably the first virus, but that's a computational method. It's, it's kind of complicated, but anyway, there's a prediction. There are three mutations that have never been seen in humans before the first virus that we have in humans. The specimens Jesse found had some of those. So we know that there are, that the Chinese have a, a viral sequences that are ancestral to what we have. And the more of those we get, the more we'll get to the, to the bottom of this. Uh, I'll point out that these sequences were from September and October of 2019, two months before any, uh, any person in the market was sick. So again, the, the timing of the market spillover uh, doesn't coincide with the genetics of the virus. Okay. Dr. Estel, anything to add to that? No, other than Jesse is certainly one of the foremost experts in this field, and if you want probably some of the best answers that science can give, then I would recommend that you request his input. Thank you. Uh, my last question. For 20 years, NIH sponsored EcoHealth's partnership with scientists from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. 
the Chinese scientists have bragged that their virus sample database is the largest in the world. They took that database offline in September 2019. NIH asked EcoHealth for research records. EcoHealth told them that the records are in the custody of the Chinese government. Is it possible that the database taken offline by the Chinese government was data collected by EcoHealth and belongs to American taxpayers? Make sure that and Dr. Quay? Well, since, since the work has been funded in part by U.S. taxpayers, then by definition, uh, access to that would be important. And uh, I, I, think, I also think that, that we don't have to rely on the Wound Institute of Virology from re releasing that. I believe within the U.S. jurisdiction, there will be copies of that database. It's too valuable not to have in your own possession if you're doing research on it. Do you think there's any way we can still get any of that data that's missing? I feel like, you know, somewhere we're going to find the grandfather of, of COVID or the a cousin or something here in, in these data banks. Why, why did they take them down? And uh, I mean, what would be the advantage of them taking it down? Do you think we can ever find what we're missing? Well, it was taken down at 2 a.m. On, on September 12th, 2019, which is... I mean, I guess everyone works hard, but that's a little suspicious to be doing it at that point in time. I believe it contains closer precursors, and my, my hypothesis is it contains the one that's 50 mutations or 100 mutations, not 1,200 away, um, and it was too obviously a, a smoking gun. But again, if you're collaborating on that and, and, and you're, you're spending 10 years building a database inside the Wilderness of Virology, you're going to mirror that database in your own facilities, which means that it's got to be at Equal Health Alliance somewhere. Thank you. Dr. Elstow, anything to add? Just note that I agree with Dr. Ebright's assessment from earlier. To the extent that China is doing this research, it's because it is scientifically sexy and glamorous and, get, and is fast, easy, publishable, et cetera. Okay. Chinese scientists have the same incentives as Western scientists in this regard. And I do not think, in fact, it's very clear that this research is not in China's strategic interest. China has no more interest than we do in handing out the blueprints to agents that can kill millions of people, including their people. This is not in the interest of any established powerful nation. And the question is, can we show leadership and persuade them of that? Because as long as we're doing it, we are making it, we are contributing to the fact that this is seen as glamorous research. It gets published in our top tier journals. Many Chinese scientists get bonuses for publishing in our top tier journals. We are driving these incentives because we persist in seeing this, again, as a health and safety issue rather than a national security issue. So I think it is in our power to change it. And I think this is one issue where our interests with, are actually aligned with those of China and really, indeed, every other established nation. These are asymmetric tools of mass death. Wow. OK. Dr. Ebright, anything we didn't ask you that we should have? Uh, that I don't know, but I did, just wanted to agree completely with the last remark by Dr. Esso. Okay. Thank you, and I yield back. I want to thank everybody for being part of this hearing. I don't see this as the end. I see this as the beginning of trying to understand what caused the pandemic and trying to come up with solutions. Uh, each of your statements, which is longer than your testimony, um, will be available for anybody who's interested. I wanted to point out one thing from Dr. Ebright's testimony, just for those who say, well, lab leaks should be discounted. They don't ever happen. At one point, Dr. Ebright writes, the second, third, fourth, and fifth entries of the SARS virus, this was the first one, into human populations occurred as a laboratory accident in Singapore in 2003, a laboratory accident in Taipei in 2003, and two separate laboratory accidents in Beijing in 2004. So for people who say that it's a conspiracy theory that this could have come from the lab, they're discounting our history. The history has had these lab leaks, and so whether or not we'll ever know for 100% certain whether this came from the lab, we have had lab leaks, and we have to realize the potential danger of these pathogens. We didn't get a great deal of time into the answer. We got a little bit into the answer, but each of the uh, scientists we asked today were asked to let us know how we could better supervise or oversee this kind of research. The interesting thing to me is I think they all worked independently, but they came up with basically very similar solutions. 
an independent body outside of the funding organizations or those receiving the funding to make the recommendations, something akin to an independent agency like a nuclear regulatory agency. In fact, I've already been using the analogy when people ask me and say, well, what's this like? And it's, it's essentially, we don't let anybody sell centrifuges to Russia or centrifuges to Iran. There are rules on the export of things. And I think uh, Dr. Esfelt in particular has talked about the security aspect of this. What I would really like to come of this, and I mean this sincerely, is I would like to have a bipartisan bill that comes forward for better oversight. Maybe it's not oversight of gain of function, but maybe includes things that some people consider to be gain of function. Maybe it's more general, of pandemic viruses. There's a lot of ways we can discuss it, but the bottom line is you can't, I don't think the people doing the research are able to adequately and objectively regulate themselves. And I think having a million people die, there should be bipartisan curiosity in this, that we should be able to move forward. So my hope is that your suggestions that you've taken the time to put in writing, you've taken the time out of your busy careers to come here, that these suggestions will become legislation. If we can get a bipartisan bill to come forward, what I'd like is that our people who help us write the legislation can communicate with the three scientists here. We're willing to hear from a dozen more scientists. Anybody who wants to, I want scientists to be involved in this. But I do think that ultimately the people making the judgment shouldn't be from one small field of science. So some have said, well, none of the three scientists there are virologists. Well, I don't have a problem with virologists being part of this, but I do have a problem with them all being virologists. The same way I have the problem with behavioral science being approved for funding by all behavioral scientists. I think that there need to be people who understand science on this, but I think there also need to be people on the committee, as Dr. Esfeld has mentioned, that understand bioterrorism and uh, biosecurity. And I think it should be a mixture. I mean, this is something we can talk to the scientific community. And I don't think an absolute ban is what we want. We want is a better oversight of this, but we can't have something where three projects have been looked at in the last seven years. I mean, that, that means they're not looking. And the fact that they didn't look at what went on in Wuhan, and then some of the folks I asked in committee about this were saying, oh, our scientists looked at it and approved it. Even that's not really true. They didn't look at the research. They just ignored the research. It didn't go before the committee. They haven't been honest. But if we want trust in public health and trust in government and trust in science and trust in research and trust in the NIH and trust in, in the grants that we give our universities, billions of dollars, we need to have transparency and honesty. We can't have a committee where the people are cloaked in secret. I mean, what is this? I mean, th this is completely insane. So I think we've made some progress. I want to move forward, and I, for one, am open to work with any Democrat in the Senate to make this a bipartisan bill and to make it an even-keeled thing where all the voices are heard, that we don't rashly create any legislation that would hamper science, but that we create something that would have oversight that might save lives. I truly think that a million people died in our country, six million people died, and I think it was from a lab link. And I think it's something that we need to have precautions against because if this gets in, and I think it was accidental, by the way, I mean, no, but I think if we don't do anything, what if this gets in the hands of somebody who actually really wants to harm America or the world or just some psychopath? What could happen? So right now we're, we're doing nothing and have changed no behavior. We've had this pandemic and we have changed not one bit of behavior. So I think it's about time we do get together and that we're all curious and that we don't make this about Republicans and Democrats. We make this about how we as a people come together to try to make this a world a better place. Thank you all for appearing.